Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Extra Serving, an award-winning podcast from Nation's Restaurant News. I'm Leanne Zinsmeister. Today, we are going to talk about earnings. More than a dozen restaurant companies have reported this week, and there is big news to be found everywhere. It is mostly good news. At Yum! Brands, digital business has grown by over $1 billion in the past year. How did three of the company's four brands generate positive same-store sales last quarter? We're going to talk about it. We'll also talk about big traffic increases at many chains, including First Watch, where sales and traffic are exceeding expectations even as off-premises sales are softening. How are they pulling it off and what other chains are seeing similar trends? We're going to discuss. And finally, we'll talk about virtual brands. Some companies like Brinker are pulling the plug, while others like Dine Brands are going in and still opening new virtual brands. This week's guest is Doug Wilmarth, president of Muya Burgers, Fries, and Shakes. And now to introduce the co-hosts for this week. I am Sam Okus, editor-in-chief of Nation's Restaurant News. And I'm Alicia Kelso, executive editor of Nation's Restaurant News. Texas Pete is taking its flavor on the road with convenient, easy-to-enjoy portion control packets. Whether it's a Texas Pete dip cup or sauce packet, your customers will be able to enjoy bold flavor for a better on-the-go dining experience, anywhere, anytime. Ask your broker for the number one portion control hot sauce or visit texaspetefoodservice.com for more information. How you guys doing today? Just dandy. I think Tired Alicia. From all the earnings, <laughs> Alicia's had a big week. <laughs> Ali- Alicia, you're gonna have earned those mojitos at the racetrack this weekend. Oh, Let mojitos. me tell you that. Mojitos are mint juleps. Learn the language. Oh, mint juleps. <laughs> Shame on me. Shame. Whatever you, what your drink of choice is at the racetrack, mint juleps, of course. Yes, yes. it's Derby Week. Happy Derby Week from Louisville. Kentucky, yes, indeed. Everybody. I gotta say, I. I'm aware of the Derby as a thing. I've watched it a couple times in my life, but until you said something this morning, I couldn't have told you it was this weekend. I could not tell you anything about this, but it's like a like a cultural thing down there, isn't it? it you know, I'm a Louisville transplant. I have only lived here for, well, only, I've lived here for about 10 years, and <laughs> I, I, it still stuns me how big of a deal this is. Um, so yes, it's it's very much a, a cultural thing, and it's not just the race this weekend or the races this weekend. It's it's a whole month of like festivities, and I mean this event brings in like four hundred million dollars to the local economy. And and wow. you know, since we're on this call, restaurants get a big influx of that, so it's kind of fun. But the real question here is, Alicia, how's your hat game? What's the hat situation going to be like? I. I used to go into the stands and I used to do the infield that I'm aged out of that phase of my life. Now I go to the backfield <laughs> and I don't wear hats. I just wear shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> Fair enough. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that sounds fun. You will, like Sam said, you'll have really earned that experience mm-hmm. this weekend. You have covered so many earnings calls for us this week. And as of right now, it's only Thursday morning. So let's Many talk about some of those, shall we? Many, Many yet to come. Yeah, we've, got <laughs> week. we've got another week ahead of us. So it's, it's fun. So much still to come. Um, so Yum Brands had a big quarter, Alicia. Um, it sounds like digital business has grown by over a billion dollars. Uh, we're looking at same store sales growth at KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. Uh, what's going on there? What's what's their uh, secret? I mean, everybody has had a pretty positive quarter so far, Um, you know, and I I don't want to be dismissive about Yum! Brand's performance by any stretch, because obviously those 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 sales are very strong, Um, you know, but we're talking about this first quarter and we have to keep the context in mind that we're lapping Omicron from last year. Um, So I think that's a big underlying narrative to much of the success that we're seeing across brands. Um, But with Yum! Brands in particular, you know, we have been talking about the consumer and where the consumer is for months now as the macroeconomic environment is still really murky. It's confusing, you know, and we started to see a little bit of trade down activity probably late last year. Executives started talking about trade down activity at their respective brands. Yum! is going to be 
in a good place if that activity is um, either growing or, you know, remaining steady because it is a a huge value player. Most QSRs will be well insulated if we do formally enter a recession. Um, But right now, you know, I know that consumers are getting a little bit more anxious about all these banking failures and, you know, interest rates were raised again yesterday. And um, so, so I think QSRs, um, in particular, Yum Brands and, and its peers, McDonald's and so forth, are going to be a, in a good position. With Yum Brands, I think it's important to call out the, the digital sales, like, as you mentioned, Leanne, uh, growing by over a billion dollars in a year. They've made a ton of investments, um, you know, so this is, this is, they're yielding the fruits of their investments. There's a return here uh, that we're starting to see, and it's still early game. Uh, so I think that that is really going to uh, be interesting as it continues to, to play out, as they continue to, to implement all of these um, things that make it easier, and, and you know, for consumers and for their team members to, to operate the restaurants. Um, if I can call out one brand specifically, we've talked about Taco Bell at length the past few quarters. <laughs> KFC remains positive, but Pizza Hut had an 8% uptick in the U.S., and it seems like they're fully turning around some of their issues that they were really struggling with last year, in particular labor um, shortages on the delivery side. Um, they've made several steps to correct those, and and we're like I said, we're seeing the fruits of that labor too. So it is really interesting to see. I mean, Pizza Hut was one of the few pizza brands through the last couple of years that really di- was not doing well. You know, we saw such a huge surge in pizza chains. Pizza Hut didn't really participate in that, but it's interesting now because Domino's and Papa John's are each having struggles right now, and Pizza Hut is actually doing well. And it's you know, I'm, not, I'm sure not any one thing that is can explain that other than to say Domino's and Papa John's kind of came back down to reality, and Pizza Hut has just is just you know kind of been climbing up that mountain. But but yeah, I mean, I, I love the quote from the Yum CE or uh, CFO who was like. We love digital. It is a win on all fronts. Or he said something along those lines because it's like, yeah, I mean, digital is not going away. I mean, the the growth in digital is purely just waiting for everybody to adopt it, right? I mean, it's never going to be 100% digital probably, but it is really just a matter of adoption. And and I don't know about you guys, but for myself anyway, once I start ordering with a brand digitally, I, I don't turn back. I'm like, oh, no. that was easy. That was great. I'm going to keep doing that. And and that's really all the growth in digital is. So when they add a billion dollars in sales, it sounds impressive, but it's just like, that's just because more people are just discovering it and that, and that's all it takes and it will never go backward. And everything about, to his point, everything about digital is good because they have control over the ordering experience. They can collect the data. They can obviously learn more about their customers. They can simplify it, make it more efficient. Everything about digital sales is great. So this is this is a good sign that Yum Brands is going the right direction. I think we'll only expect to see this trend in digital sales and how it's going to be elevating all of their brands continue to to go that direction. Totally, yeah. As a consumer, I mean, I whenever I'm in the office, I usually get lunch from Dig. It's right across the street. I order on the app. I walk in. I pick it up off the shelf. A couple of weeks ago, the app wasn't working. I couldn't get my order to go through. I couldn't get it to go through on the website. And I was so frustrated until I remembered I could walk over there and tell them what I wanted and they would give it to me. But it took me a long time to come to that conclusion. Um, And that's embarrassing for me. But it it is like they rely so heavily. And like, I don't know how many people the app didn't work. And so they closed out and opened up the Just Salad app or the Shake Shack app because those are also we're in like fast casual alley there. In Murray Hill, um, Leanne, I wonder. I wonder because I, I, um, you know, a lot of operators actually toggle online ordering off when they don't have the labor support for those digital channels. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it could have been that, but it was fully just like not loading. I guess I, as a consumer, I would expect some sort of notification of like, you know, come on in. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like if you're gonna do that, I guess remind me that there's another way to get my lunch. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point because, like, think about this. I don't know about you guys, but, like, when you um, call a doctor or you call some service that you need um, help with something, schedule something, whatever, and you get into an automated thing and you're pressing buttons, but your issue is too complicated to be described in their options, and you're just like, I just want to talk to somebody. But you're going through and you're like, I can't, like, at no point can I talk to a human being 
it's it, there is a too far, you know, in the digital evolution. And and you, restaurants actually do talk about this. Like the restaurants have expressed, we still need somebody to answer the phone because you're always going to have that one example of a, of a, per, a customer or a, a situation where they can't get what they need via digital. And it's also, you know, in Leah, in your experience, what happens when it fails? Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's important that it's like there have to be you have to um, help your customer through the experience that they want. And some customers, that's going to be analog, right? It's going to be walking into the, into the restaurant or giving a phone call um, because digital can't be the all-time 100% savior. But, but it, sure is, um, it sure is helpful and amazing when you need it to be. Yeah, I think the, the, the whole – the big objective with digital, right, is to remove friction. And we've been hearing frictionless since well before the pandemic. This was a big topic um, last week when I was in Chattanooga at a voice AI event. I spoke on a panel there about voice AI and how voice is sort of that last removal of friction. Um, you know, it, and it goes back to that blessing and a curse. So, you know, technology promises to be that, that you know – end all removal of, a, of friction, but it can be compounded. That friction is compounded when it doesn't work mm -hmm. or if it's too complicated to work. And so it actually ends up doing the opposite of what it's intended to do by adding more frustration, by adding more friction, um, as was your case, Leanne. And I know if I go to order some, you know, somewhere and I'm not going to name a brand specifically, but every time I order from there, this, this is why I don't order from there because it's too complicated and I'm tired of going, it, you know, it should be one step, two steps at the most. And, and if it's not working, you know, all of those things sort of uh, add up to, to doing, like I said, what, what it, their, the opposite intention is for this technology. Totally. Well, Yum Brands has really figured it out. And I hope other brands, you know, continue to go in that direction. Some other good news we're seeing this quarter. Uh, traffic is up at a bunch of restaurants are talking about this. Now, same store sales, not really a surprise to see jumps because restaurants are still continuing to increase menu prices. M menu prices are a lot higher than they were a year ago. But traffic, I think we weren't expecting to see. Even the executives sound surprised when they talk about it on these earnings calls. You know, oh my gosh, and can you believe it? More people are coming here, which is unexpected because of course, the way the economy is, you expect consumers to cut back um, on dining out, it's usually one of the first categories to go, but, uh, we've seen lots of chains report positive traffic numbers, um, including at first watch a family dining chain, uh, where executives say sales and traffic numbers have exceeded their expectations this quarter. Uh, so what do we think's going on with traffic in the industry? Yeah, I mean, it could it could be a, you know, customers go through a period of not eating out much and realize how much they miss restaurants and they want to come back. And, you know, maybe it's some of that. Um, uh, it could be that it's spring. And I don't know about you, but when it gets sunny and warm out today, as thankfully it's hopefully going to be kind of today, I want to get outside. I want to go do stuff, you know. Um, those might be small, you know, small reasons for ha traffic coming back. But... Uh, but I don't know. It is confusing because economically speaking, with inflation still as bad as it was, we got another rate hike today. Um, it, it, menu prices could continue to go up. It's sort of confounding. But I think overall, demand is just high. And and to your point, Leanne, and we we're talking about you know first watch. And then a lot of the other brands that we've seen very positive um, traffic from BJ's was another I know we've talked about. Not to skip ahead, but when you talk, when, you know, IHOP and Applebee's, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. All of these are full service chains, right? So that's especially interesting because here you have all these full service chains that are on the higher end of the price spectrum um, that are partic particularly doing well. And and First Watch, I think the most interesting part about their sales. Their, their sales are up 23%, something like that. Um, it, it's it's insane. Part of that is new units. Um, you know, their same store sales, I believe, were 12%. Um, but their traffic is up. But their off-premises is actually softening, according to Chris um, Tomaso, their CEO. And so I think that's an interesting indicator of sort of the trends of where things are going. You know, First Watch is, and I have this, I feel the same way, which is, I don't want to do first watch off premises. I don't want to get my pancakes and bacon 
mm-hmm. 20 minutes later. I want to sit down and, and they have beautiful restaurants. I want to go sit in a first watch and eat those, right? I don't want to get those at home where they'll be soggy and cold. And so these full service restaurants, especially, I think it's, you know, recognizing this customers want to experience. They want to get into their restaurants and sit down and enjoy that experience, have hot food when it's supposed to be hot. Um, and so, so you do see that, but IHOP is kind of different, right? Like IHOP is actually still enjoying strong off-premises business. So I, I can't use that as a blanket statement across the industry and saying, yeah, guests just want to get in restaurants because <laughs> there's all kinds of differing perspectives out there from these restaurant chains. But for somebody like a first watch, I, it has to be that it's just like people are done doing the off-premises things for some of these brands that are really intended to be enjoyed in-house, you know, with the hot food hot and the cold food cold. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's pent up demand still. I think that's, I don't know why that surprises us. I, I, I have pent up demand for experiences. BJ's talked about this at length on their call is we're, we're doing well on the traffic side because people want these experiences still. And, you know, two years is too long for the American consumer to not have that experience apparently. And there's a long tailwind on this, on this pent up demand. Um, and, and to your point, Sam, that the traffic, you know, that we're seeing, not just at First Watch, because that is a very experiential brand, but, you know, across many, if not most of these, I, I got to say, it really surprised me coming into the new year. I wasn't sure what to expect in Q1, because like I said, we've been reporting on mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the um, mixed outlook, the mixed environment for, uh, you know, t- over two quarters now. Um, so I thought Q1 was going to have a, a, a pretty solid picture of where the consumer is, especially with, you know, with not a whole lot of clarity on, you know, on, on inflation has cooled a little bit, but not dramatically. And menu prices are still elevated. In fact, grocery prices are now lower, um, you know, and that trend has really kind of s- surprised me. But all this stuff is recent. We have to keep in mind that this is a Q1 um, you know, this is Q1. So I think in Q2 and Q3, we'll get a better picture of where the consumer is because these factors are starting to become, um, you know, a little clearer now with menu prices staying elevated, with inflation staying a little bit on the relentless side and with, you know, financing becoming a little bit more um, expensive. And again, with all these layoffs and just the general uncertainty, um, I think this stuff is just starting to pick up. And so consumers, if they have trepidation about, you know, dining out, I think we'll, we'll start again, we'll start to see that in Q2 um, and especially in Q3. Totally. So another non-trend that we're seeing, something that like different companies are taking in totally different directions is this off-premises virtual brands thing right now. So earlier this week, Brinker announced that they were going to shut down one of their virtual brands uh Maggiano's Italian Classics is no more. They're maintaining their It's Just Wings brand, uh, but shutting down the second one and really focusing on Dine In. And then Dine Brands reported and said, we love virtual brands. We're opening even more virtual brands. Uh, and that's so interesting to me because these are both companies that really focus on like the full service segment. Of course, Dine has fuzzies now, but they're primarily full service family dining. So we've got two companies that in my mind, I tend to see as pretty similar. They tend to follow similar trends and now they're doing totally opposite things on virtual brands. So what's going on in the virtual brand space? Do we have any idea or are we just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks out? Do we have any idea about anything? I mean, honestly, that's a great question, Alicia. What do we (laughs) even know? know (laughs) What have we been doing here? (laughs) I mean, I'm trying to articulate this stuff in writing and I can't. (laughs) (laughs) I, I mean, I don't, Sam, I don't know, you know, what your opinion is. I, I think I'm going to let you take thing, the first crack at this, Alicia. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the Brinker, the Brinker thing comes, comes, comes back clearly to Kevin Hockman coming on board last year and immediately reining in some of the, what I, I think, super, superfluous thing. I mean, just getting that efficiency that we've been talking about, um, you know, for, for a, a while now. Um, and, and really focusing on the core of the Brinker business because, frankly, it needed it. And, um, 
And I think that this, you know, and, and yes, it's just wings is still operating, operating, but he mentioned in August um, that they were going to right size it because it's only 6% of the, the mix and, and they were probably spending a little bit more than 6% of their attention on it. So <laughs> while it, while it's just wings still exists and is still operating, it, they're right, they're right sizing it at the same time they're sunsetting it. Uh, their other virtual brand. And I, I, again, I think this is just part of his overall strategy coming in uh, late last year to, to uh, sort of focus on, on the core, you know, fundamentals of Brinker. With IHOP, um, you know, I had a conversation with John Payton, the CEO of Dine Brands, after their call yesterday. And this was one of my, you know, my, my biggest curiosities when I had the chance to talk to him is, you know, you, one of your peers is sunsetting a virtual brand. There's a lot of debate right now about the, you know, um, vitality of virtual brands in this as we seem to be stagnated on delivery um, and even retrenching on delivery in many, um, you know, instances because of a more discerning cons consumer. Um, but he, you know, he, he basically pointed out that their strategy is to make sure they're not complicating things, that they're, you know, they're not using new equipment or new SKUs, um, and that they're, and, and, and they have, they have found that this, this virtual business now with four brands through IHOP, um, very much supplements their business, particularly on the late night side, um, you know, where they, 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 they don't have, they didn't have the labor for a while and now they're just sort of clawing that back. They were getting a big uptick um, during those hours from their virtual brands, um, and he mentioned a couple of stats that interested me: dinner businesses up ten percent, and late night overnight businesses up, I think, sixteen percent. And he attributed both of those um, those growth patterns to uh, the virtual brand business that, uh, again, you know, supplements that business at night. Something else that he said: uh, IHOP had a thousand, about a thousand. 24-7 uh, restaurants pre-pandemic. It has slowly started to add more of those as the labor picture becomes better. Um, it was at 700 and now it's around 750 at 24-7. And again, he attributed a lot of that to the virtual brand business, adding those incremental sales uh, without a lot of complexity. So I think, you know, I have just as a different strategy. So franchisees are interested in having this revenue stream at that day part. And the, and the off-premises business really could be key, right? Where like a first watch, off-premises is softening. They rely very much on the dine-in. Why would a company like that do virtual, which I, of course I'm not saying that they were. We're um, not comparing them necessarily. But just to say, if you're doing strong dine-in business, um, you don't need those digital innovations like virtual brands because – all your customers are coming in to experience you in person and um, virtual brands are all off premises business all about tapping into your customer uh, in the digital you know footprint or whatever so for a brand like ihop doing strongly in off premises business their customers are accustomed to engaging with them digitally so that a virtual brand would make sense um uh, so I, I that could be a a, a big sort of tip off to um, why there are these differing approaches. It's really fascinating to watch Brinker, though, because it's just wings. We were, like, all over that in 2021, right? I mean, just talking about here was a brand that out of the gate did, like, $150 million in sales or something crazy. I mean, um, so they're still they're still oper operating and um, – uh, you know, pardon me, would just would be surprised if they ever pulled the plug on that because it's such a simple operation to run. Um, and wings are very much a uh, takeout or delivery oriented food. Um, but it is it is so interesting to watch the cycles of these trends and to be like, wow, two years ago, this was all we could talk about. And here they quietly just go, Meh. you know, Meh, it's not where really what we're doing anymore. And it's also funny because we, of course, in 2020 and 2021, over sensationalized everything and and you know we're speaking in very hyperbolic terms of how much the industry was different and this is a permanent thing for sure um and really what we're seeing with virtual brands is they're settling into the niche category that they were always destined to become which is smart for some people not for everybody it's possible to overdo it and it's going to shake out to where you just have the you know strong subset of virtual brands from the very strong players you, certainly the virtual dining concepts and the next bites of the world have a place in this industry. They always will. 
but I don't think you're going to see as much virtual brand development uh, beyond those key players from here, just because I think it's going to settle out that business. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right. Well, can't wait to talk about all this again in a week when we have even more restaurant companies numbers. If Alicia and data is to still alive, <laughs> <laughs> if she hasn't drowned in earnings <laughs> reports by then, which I think she might. Uh, all right. Well, thank you or, both. Or bourbon. For... Or bourbon. Or bourbon. At the I know. Yeah. Well, Alicia, you are now one meeting closer to being at the Derby this weekend. <laughs> so, how's that feel? <laughs> Check us off the list. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks for having.